In this podcast, we'll take you on a journey where you will discover that at the junction of tech and copyright, while we are living in a digital age with unlimited potential, many walls have come up, making it more difficult for users and creators to access, share, and reuse what is available online and offline. The journey will make many stops. We're interviewing a variety of people ranging from internet entrepreneurs to librarians and publishing professionals, from digital rights activists to sci-fi writers, to ask them how copyright and tech affect their daily lives. In this episode, our guest is Catherine Maher. So Catherine Maher is a former chief executive officer and executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation, and her background is in the field of information and communications technology, and she worked in the nonprofit and international sectors. Uh, focusing on the use of technology, uh, enabling human rights and international development. So, Catherine, welcome. As CEO of Wikimedia, you were actively engaged in many copyright-related controversies. And perhaps the most famous one, at least the one I know best, is uh, the famous uh, monkey selfie dispute. Um, for those of you who don't know that case, uh, the owner of a photo camera claimed copyrights on a selfie taken by a monkey who actually stole his camera and took it into the jungle. Uh, he actually claimed that he lost a lot of revenue because of Wikimedia um, publishing this photo uh, and distributing it on their platforms. Um, Wikimedia, on the other hand, claimed that no copyrights can be claimed by young human actors. Uh, maybe you can give us some background here and what happened and, and what was the rationale behind Wikimedia's decision to keep the picture online. Yeah, sure. I mean, the rationale from our perspective was was really straightforward. There is under under U.S. copyright law, there is not a instance in which a non-human entity can claim copyright. It would be like assigning a computer copyright. Animals just don't have the status of a human creator. And so to the extent this monkey took this photograph, as was claimed by the photographer, then the monkey essentially... Um, supplants the human creator as the author of the photograph of the photograph but the monkey is not capable of actually having rights in the sense of intellectual property and so uh, this i actually think was a fairly straightforward case from a copyright perspective and a few years after um, we engaged with this and conducted our own assessment and, and published that this was our assessment the u.s copyright office actually published its own um I think it's every five years or every 10 years, it gives sort of guidance on copyright and so e examples. And it actually uses the example of a animal that takes a photograph. Uh, so we felt really sort of, you know, backed up relative to our analysis of the law. But I think that, you know, just on a human level, this was, this was a tough case. This was a place where I felt very, I felt a lot of empathy for the creator. And, and I have to say, and I, I don't know if I've said this before publicly, but now that I'm not in my role, I think I can. I'm not entirely convinced that the photographer didn't have more of an active role in setting up the photo, but once the initial story was out there and he was on the record um, that he had, that the monkey had taken the photo entirely, whether because that was just a really great story that he wanted to use to sell the photo or otherwise, um, it was really hard to walk back from there. You know, the original statement of, um, the statement of origin for the photo was what it was. And according to that statement of origin from the photographer's own testimony, I, the copyright case was pretty cut and dried. Now, does that mean that, that that was the actual story? I just don't know at this point. It is such a remarkable photo. It, it, I've always wondered if there was more to the backstory to that. But again, from the perspective of what we were doing uh, and what our projects are and, and how we interpret uh, copyright in the public domain, this was, this was a really clear case of a public domain image. It just as a, a little bit more background on this, because I think maybe our listeners might be interested in it. So um, this entire claim of Wikimedia was based on U.S. copyright law because a photographer was U.S.-based citizen. Do you have any idea on, on like how this works elsewhere in the world? So I believe the photographer is actually a British citizen, um, yeah. but, the, okay, yeah. but we're a UK, U.S. based entity and so we host our content in under u.s based jurisdiction and so that is the way that we apply our tests it's the same test that we apply relative to um any any information that's posted and of course the united states has a particularly uh liberal um legal regime with regards to content hosting and so you don't so uh it's not just about copyright it's also about sort of the tests around freedom of speech and freedom of expression in the united states um in the uk i, I actually am not sure i i, I looked at it a long time ago but I, I can't remember at this point um i i don't believe it's dissimilar i do think that there may be a degree of difference around the intention of um a human 
uh, assistant in the same way like an aide might be also able to claim some degree of uh, intellectual rights um, on, a, on a project. If you have a collaborative project in which multiple authors are involved, um, then multiple authors have some degree of rights based on the legal construct um, under which those people operate. But again, I, I you know, this is one where somebody who's an expert in UK copyright <laughs> law should probably be the one commenting rather than me. I think, I think we'll have one on the, in the series <laughs> later on. So uh, good, we'll good. get back to that. <laughs> we'll get back to that on that point. So, um, if, if there's no, no copyright on an item, uh, whether it's like because copyright has expired or because there's never been copyright in the first place, like, like, uh, it was claimed in this, uh, this, uh, monkey selfie case. Um, we're talking about the public domain and, and the discussion of what, what is part of the public domain and what's not. Again, the monkey selfie case really like puts this on, on edge, this discussion. It always has been a battleground for open culture activists and rights holders. Like you said in your previous comment, like, you know, you were set yourself in doubt a little bit whether the photographer did not, could, could not claim certain certain rights to this photo um so wikimedia has but wikimedia has always been like one of the biggest let me call it vaults of public domain images in the, in the entire world like at least i use it a lot if i if i'm looking for rights free pictures and i think yeah, comments is wonderful this. yeah so yeah, um yeah. It, it it has really because of that position it often been at the center of this discussion and I would like to know how would you how would you see this concept of the public domain evolve in the next decade? We know it's under threat in some places. We know it's being expanded um, and with large volumes of new new um, uh, items um, as well. And and what what strategies as well could be applied to get people to understand the richness and the importance of the public domain? Because I feel often that people don't really realize like what what does it mean when a picture when when a picture or a text is in the public domain what they can do with it um so how can it be like defined how can it be defended how can it be strengthened um i'm i'm very really curious to hear your views on that yeah i think i mean one of the most remarkable things about the monkey selfie instance yeah. was in fact was the fact that it became an avenue to educate people around what the public domain is i think that you know there are certain sort of texts and works and images that we automatically um through socialization as as people everywhere in the globe sort of assume an inherent right to as part of our shared humanity things like you know unesco world heritage uh yeah. sites for example although those are not um necessarily sort of what we think yeah. of as a printed picture or a, a, or text itself you know those rights to the architect's creation uh, are automatically assumed to sort of belong to this common human heritage but making that translation to more recent works i think is very difficult for many members of the public largely because we've been so socialized to understand that copyright or intellectual property rights are the dominant structure by which um, by which we engage with ownership of work. Uh, and I think that that means that most people just come to almost any creative work with the assumption that that work belongs to a rights holder and that that doesn't belong to the public. And so sort of uneducating or re-educating the public to have an innate assumption that certain things do belong to the public trust or to the public good is a, is a tough conversation given the nature and the structure of the way that almost all of us first encounter rights-based properties. Now, I think that one of the places that is most interesting around this is, is actually um, the way in which we can engage with the production of knowledge or the production of art or the production mm -hmm. of creativity um, through public funding. And so, I mean, this is obviously where open rights activists have had the most success. This is often where, um, you know, we see the greatest richness in the public domain. For example, our images from space. Uh, the images that are produced by the U.S. space program through NASA are all automatically public domain because all U.S. government sort of knowledge production goes into the public domain. It's not it's not just space, but that's one of those ones that is we've done a really wonderful job educating the public or uh, acculturing the public to assume that those images should be public. And in reality, I think that, well, and I think that that's a great example because you don't need to engage in a really complex conversation around rights holding. All you need to say is like, look, there's public funding associated with this. There's a public value to it. Therefore, it is a public good. 
I think having a conversation like that with the public is the best place to start really understanding what the value to the public is of the public domain. It becomes a little bit more complicated when we start getting into things like orphan works and, you know, life, life plus you know, however many decades. Mm-hmm. Um, and we start looking at, you know, there's this huge gap between what we understand of sort of Shakespeare as being in the canon and more recent works by more recent authors and artists um, and understanding sort of, you know, when and what point that comes in. So I tend to be a big proponent of saying like, well, let's find the things that people automatically understand the value of and use that as the jumping off point to have that conversation and then talk about why from our shared human human humanity perspective or shared human mm-hmm. heritage perspective it's so important that we have you know reasonable on um reasonable terms on copyright and intellectual property in order to continue to facilitate creativity. Because of course, that was the original intention of copyright, at least in sort of a US constitutional perspective. And given that the US is such a powerful negotiator of rights uh, on the global Mm -hmm. stage, um, I really like that framework to come from. Thank you. Related to this, um, so you've you've said that cultural heritage is going to be a really important uh, catalyst for you know getting people to understand the value of the public domain um, uh, and taking uh, the discussion a little bit like worldwide, especially in Europe. Um, during the adoption of the recent uh, EU copyright directive, um, Wikimedia has really been like a poster and a very vocal advocate of the the freedom of panorama exception in Europe. Um, was, was that the some of the copyright directive, some of the language in the copyright directive would make it almost impossible for Wikipedia to operate given yeah. given some of the limitations and so. What ended up happening was, in addition to the conversation around freedom of panorama, which I don't think we were successful um, in being able to advocate for as we would have hoped, and I think that's because, again, freedom of, of panorama is kind of an obscure, um, an obscure issue for many people. And, and more to the mm-hmm. point, it's actually not an issue that is particularly salient in people's lives. So the example that's always given is when you take a photograph, when you go on, you know, vacation to Paris and take a photograph in front of the Eiffel Tower during the day, and it's fine, freedom of panorama. Um, you have that right because the IP of the Eiffel Tower is in the public domain. But then if you take a photo at night, you've got the images of the light show that has been added to the the tower in the last few decades. And so because the IP of that light show still re- is retained by, um, by the artist or, or the um, the benefactor, I suppose um, that then is not some that that is not subject to freedom of panorama because that IP is still an active form of IP. But you know what? So many people go to Paris and take a photo of the Eiffel Tower and post it on their social media feeds, and nobody comes after them for it, despite the fact that it's in violation of all sorts of terms of use and services and everything else. And so I think freedom of panorama tends to be a really tough conversation to have with people because there's not a tangible impact on their lives in most instances. Now, that is not it's not entirely the case all the time. We do see takedowns, you know, for many, many years. Yeah. Um, what is it? The Atomium in, in, um, in Brussels, Brussels yeah. didn't have an image on Wikipedia because of the fact that it, it was within, um, st- it was still under, uh, under protection of copyright. And so that was, that was like a, that was a huge gap from a perspective of cultural understanding of a city and understanding of its landmarks. And so it's, but it's harder to find those examples that I think really resonate with individuals. And it's mm. harder to find those examples in a way that really are persuasive to legislators. Now on the Wikipedia carve out with the EU copyright directive, I mean, this was quite controversial. Essentially, uh, we found ourselves in a position where the written text, one of the versions of the written text, um, not the version that ultimately passed, would have made it very difficult for Wikipedia to operate um, in the European Union uh, because of some of the limitations in the text around the sharing of, of copyright images. And I think it was like, with snippets of links um, to other copyrighted texts, which Wikipedia, of course, uses in all of our citations and all of our outbound links. Um, and what ended up happening was we received a uh, exemption as an educational uh, entity as a nonprofit. I think it was, the language was actually a, such as a free online encyclopedia. And, and the reason that was, um, and so of course, that was great, we were able to continue to operate. But I think for many members of our community, we actually saw that as a little bit of a failure. Because what ended up happening was we got an exemption and a carve out that was specific to us. But in a way that did not advance broader goals around free culture and around ensuring um, a a understanding of copyright that is permissive and creator focused. And so while we were grateful, of course, that that was something that allowed Wikipedia to continue to exist and be online for so many hundreds of millions of users across Europe, nonetheless, it it did feel a little bit like a concession relative to our overall values around how we believe um, 
that that we should engage with free knowledge and, and with copyright overall. Okay, thank you. That was very was very clear. I mean, at least to just to pick back on your on your atomium, it, um, I think what what one of the problems there was was actually that the rights holder organization is is known to be quite. Literally looking for infringements. Yeah. So yes. that's that's yes. of course exactly. I think plays a big role, doesn't that um if if you have if they don't care, like you know, you can you, you can probably get away with everything. But uh in that yeah, particular I mean, I... case it was really they really were actively scouring on the internet for um yeah, in their eyes abuse of the image, which uh, That's right. That's yeah. right. And I think so, that that highlights some of the challenges with something like Freedom of Panorama, because Wikipedia, given what I just shared, was a is an educational platform that is meant to be a general reference for the public. Uh, we are not a profit driven entity, and yet even within the contract, even within the construct of the work that we did and the mission that we served, and and the fact that we made no profit off the work, we still could not host that image uh, given the constraints on on Freedom of Panorama. And so that sort of shows you that there isn't that real flexibility that would be necessary to be able within the and so with the, within the intellect, current intellectual property uh, regime uh, in order to be able to make accommodations that are sort of sen common sense accommodations, which I think is what most people who are engaged in the conversation around copyright reform are really looking for. Okay. So um, I think this is a very fine example of uh, one of the walls that people can <laughs> run into uh, just linking right. back to the title of this blog, uh, blog uh, podcast series. Um, so it's a, it's world culture. And, and what, what I always ask, what we always ask our guests is, is, can you like describe a particular moment when you actually hit that wall and that when you thought there's something wrong here, like maybe not like the idea of, of for the start of your career, but at least like the first time you really think like, okay, this is not, Oh, well, I mean, I hey, yeah. the first time I really started thinking about free culture was the start of my career. I was a student at NYU, um, New York University here in New York, which is where I'm based currently. And I was a really big fan of this remix that you may have heard of called The Grey Album, which was, yeah. was DJ Danger Mouse's remix of um, Jay-Z's Black Album and the Beatles' White Album. And it was done without the rights of permissions granted and secured by either of the producers of those original two albums. And so The Grey Album was essentially... Um, a form of uh, it was in violation of, of the rights holders permissions, but it was this incredible piece of art and this incredible piece of work. Um, and, and I remember that there was this moment where everybody on the internet grayed out to recognize the frustrations with the major labels for not licensing to danger mouse, uh, the original tracks in order to be able to make this sort of a legitimate remix. Um, that was my first encounter with free culture. You know, I, I don't know that I was on strong legal grounds caring so much about this. I think that, you know, the rights holders did have a point, um, but it did speak to the limitations uh, that sort of stand in the way of remix culture um, and prevent us from being perhaps as creative as we'd like to be with artifacts of, of popular culture um, across, across different decades. More recently, I think what really struck me when I was at Wikipedia and one of my great frustrations uh, was, was actually the area of um, contemporary art and contemporary public figures. So contemporary art is not represented at all on Wikipedia, almost all contemporary art for obvious reasons. Reasons, the rights remain with sort of the holders or the purchasers. And it means that uh, much of contemporary art is is withheld from, from public view. And so one of the things that I cared a lot about at Wikipedia was our collaboration with um, academic institutions, libraries, cultural institutions, in order to be able to broaden the access of the public to their collections. So millions of people go to museums, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people go to museums all around the world every single year in every country that has them. And yet, those millions of people are not able to go to all of the millions of museums, right? So if you never have the opportunity to set foot in um, in Sweden and go visit the Royal Armory Museum, you will never have the opportunity to access it, what is contained within its collection. And the same is true for, you know, every, every museum. Like you have to be physically present in most places to engage with the museum's collection. So in in places um, like the great encyclopedic museums, like the Louvre, the British Museum, the Metropolitan Museum, which I admit are all sort of in Western countries, um, acknowledge that, they have done a really wonderful job of, of 
bringing their collections online. And since much of their, those collections are in fact in the public domain, also making them accessible in ways that was, was previously unimaginable to the public. So that anywhere you are in the world, you can have access to high quality imaging um, scans of, of items in their collection. And that is remarkable. It is such a tremendous gift to humanity. And yet, essentially, you have a missing century that sits behind us where so many innovations, cultural and otherwise, artistic and otherwise, um, that shape so much of the culture that we live in. And, and, and so many of the, both the positive aspects and the negative aspects of our culture, looking back at issues of sort of colonialism and representation, as well as some of the most exalted forms of art that have come out of struggle and conflict and, and, um, and great, great global wars are not available to the public, regardless of where you are in the world, because they remain behind walls. And that, to me, is such a tremendous loss intellectually, culturally, creatively, because it means that there are, are real barriers to entry and access to what I view as, you know, our common record of humanity, creativity, and shared understanding. And so I just remember learning about the concept of the lost century or, and I, and, and just saying, yeah, yeah, that, that's a huge problem. That is a, an incredible limitation um, on, yeah. on sharing and, and knowledge. Sorry, and yeah. never put good <laughs> one, you step down as a, a CEO of Wikimedia and, and your closing statement, you said that um, this free knowledge movement, um, like feel, it feels like we're at a nat natural inflection point, an opportunity to look forward to what Wikimedia can become. And we have built together a thriving, resilient and diverse global community devoted to knowledge for the world. Um, my question is, when I read this, like, like, how can we actually make this work in an online and connected world? Um, what needs to change? Um, how can we try to make it happen? I mean, as a very good talent, I could share, like, what, what should 2030 look like in your most oh, idealistic well, views? A... And uh, you can also <laughs> share your more, most, uh, your most pessimistic, <laughs> pessimistic views if you want to. Yeah. I mean, un unfortunately, I think from, from the perspective of copyright, and I don't mean to be so pessimistic, but so many sort of, large pieces of um, legislation of uh, just thinking about the EU copyright directive that, you know, that was a decade in the works. It's going to be some time before we have the opportunity to take a bite at that apple again. Uh, the opportunities around negotiation on intellectual property come, come infrequently. And when they do, they tend to be determinative for decades out uh, and determinative in ways that don't just affect the jurisdictions uh, that, that pass those laws or pass those regulations, but, uh, but but jurisdictions globally, because as go, you know, the two largest sort of economic uh, influences or three largest, if you want to include sort of aspects of, of ASEAN, so so goes the world. And this is a common thing that we hear. I remember being in Uruguay and talking to some of our Uruguayan comedians and they go, oh, yeah, it's so ironic that, you know, so much of the uh, the. Um, understanding of our contemporary intellect, global intellectual property regime is often referred to by our country's name because of course we had very little influence as a nation and influence in, in actually determining what that copyright regime would be. We're a small country, we just don't have that much power to be able to negotiate you know, at scale against some of these larger economies. So I, unfortunately, when I look at 2030, I don't see a tremendous amount of space for movement um, it, just simply because of just recent history. But what I do see is more opportunity for free knowledge writ large. And what I mean by that is, you know, you, you can be a creator and choose to avail yourself of copyleft. You can be a creator and choose to put your works in the public domain. It's one of my favorite things about some of the competitions that we ran at Wikimedia Commons, our uh, media repository site, a, a sister project to Wikipedia, uh, were the projects like Wiki Loves Africa, which every single year had a different theme and incentivized people to go out and participate in a contest and take spectacular, I mean, truly spectacular images of everything from the sublime to the quotidian, from images of great works of architecture, um, to images of people in the marketplace, you know, selling their wares and doing their jobs, uh, people driving taxis and, and going about their daily business. And those contributions to the free knowledge ecosystem are incredibly powerful relative to representation and giving us a better understanding of the world in which we, occu which we occupy and live. So, of course, creators have a lot that they can do in this space of enriching, enriching free knowledge. The thing that was most exciting to me, and I, and I think the greatest opportunity for not just Wikipedia, but, but overall for the free knowledge space, is really recognizing that so much of the work of documentation and in, interrogation of our history and what we deem to be notable has, has already occurred in countries like um, 
United or sorry, in places like North America or Europe, um, in places where internet penetration has been high, digital literacy is high, and ha and has been for many years, the access to entirely new groups of people through digital connectivity is one of the places where I think we have such an incredible opportunity to learn from the world as we start to see. Um, new generations come online that previously didn't have access or didn't have the sort of consistent pervasive access who will be able to tell the stories about their own lives, their own history, their own countries, their own cultures through their own words and through their own works. To me, that is the space where free knowledge uh, will continue to bloom. As we looked around at the sort of in, in the work of doing our Wikimedia strategy work, we found that by the year 2100, 42% of the world's population will be African. 42% of the world's population. And in all the places where Wikipedia currently thrives, such as North America, Europe, Russia, uh, Japan, some of the largest users of Wikipedia, all those populations are on the decline. And so we tend to think of the world as sort of being mapped and all the free knowledge as, as, as existing and all of the great works as being already accessible or already being produced. And the reality is that's simply not true. Um, very much, The next century very much belongs to places uh, and cultures and peoples that we have not yet fully heard from. And the rise of that creativity and that influence and that cultural determination is something that fills me with great great joy and excitement and you know the remixes that are going to come out of those uh, of this next wave of, of interactions between between sort of these um, seismic shifts uh, around sort of cultural dominance on the internet is is very exciting to me very practically i'm a creator and i want to put my work like let's let's say a picture you know like because it's because it's maybe in the best example i want to put my 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 work uh, in the public domain. I want to make it free and reusable for everybody. What do I do? Where do I start? I have an internet connection. Let's assume that. Sorry, you have an internet connection? Uh, well, I mean, there are different places that you can go to be able to share that. Please don't share it immediately out onto a social, large social media platform because the terms of their use are automatically that they retain rights to your product. So if you have your own site, you can always upload it there and assign whatever license you want. Um, but, you know, if you'd like to use something, a project like Wikipedia, Wikimedia Commons, of course, I'm, I'm deeply biased, but I do encourage that. We make it very easy to assign rights when you engage in that upload. And once those rights are assigned, whether it's you choose to use something like CC BY um, or Creative Commons, yeah. So, oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, Excuse yeah. me. Like a, one of the whether it's either a copy left um, license, like a Creative Commons license, or simply putting things into the public domain, that then makes that accessible to so many people to be able to reuse as they see fit. And to your to your point earlier, Gwen, so many people use these images all over the world. The number of newspaper articles or uh, media articles that are illustrated by them. Trust me, the number of conference presentations <laughs> that I have given <laughs> with images, thanks so, with so much gratitude to these creators that have mm -hmm. shared their work. Um, these tend to be incredibly influential. And, and the more works that we have of the contemporary world in particular, you know, the more that we can really illustrate and understand the environment in which we live. And then from the other perspective, from the user perspective, What's the best practice when I want to reuse something that is either in the public domain or has been donated, like to the to um, the true Creative Commons license? Uh, because you know, when I make a presentation, like I try to acknowledge the uh, you yeah know, the original creator, but a lot of people sort of I think forget this or don't yeah. I mean, this it. is yeah. this is the whole the whole sort of dream of the sharing economy is not just that we have access to these great works that are, are shared um, under more permissive licenses, but that we also acknowledge the sharing and acknowledge the creators. And so, uh, of course, yeah. you know, all of Creative Commons licenses ask you to, uh, well, most of Creative Commons licenses ask for attribution to the original creator. And that's true of Wikipedia as well. If you go to any image that's on Wikipedia, if it's not in the public domain, what you'll generally find yeah. is the license, the rights holder. So who produced that? You know, what license they, they released it under? Um, any sort of further specifications about how that might be used? So there's some, you know, variation within Creative Commons licenses Wikipedia doesn't actually uh, in, in allow non-commercial Creative Commons licenses, which is a whole sort of controversial thing within the Creative Commons community as, as 
to the purpose of NC and then, um, and within sort of the, anyway, within the broader Wikipedia space as well, but, but we don't allow it because we couldn't enforce it as a platform mm -hmm. was kind of, kind of the thinking. And, and then there's some people who think that yeah. NC sort of just doesn't even live it up to the ideals of copy left. And so, you know, I leave those debates to be had because I think, I think also debates guess, and, <laughs> we'll have a guest. Yeah. In our, in our right. 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 Important, this, so. important, important, important and robust conversations. Um, but the biggest thing that you can do is you can look at what the uh, the original publisher of the work, what license uh, terms they publish it under, and make sure that you attribute it. Usually, this means in a um, like in a sideshow presentation, just putting that individual's name and the license details at the bottom of an image, or you can also do it in a, an appendix to a work. So you can, you know, publish it at the end of a book or um, at the end of a video. Uh, and both of these things are considered acceptable ways of doing it. It's just really about attribution. So who made the work and sort of what's the license under which it was created and any other originating information, the more the better. If you've got a name for the work, you know, by all means, you should publish that as well. Um, it's great to be able to share. It's great to be able to reuse. It's great to be able to remix. And it's, it's also wonderful and joyful to be able to give credit. Thank you. I think it was, a, it was a very nice closing statement, Catherine. But if you have any, do you have anything? Did we miss anything? Like, is there anything that's on your chest that you want to uh, that you want to share? Because now, now is the time. Yeah, anything I'm actually important just looking. that we haven't discussed. No, I mean, I, I love that we started with monkey selfie. It was such, <laughs> it's such a, such a moment for Wikipedia that we never really expected to become the moment that it was. But again, a great educational opportunity and a great opportunity to discuss the complexities of, of um, intellectual property in the public domain with, with a, such a, such a compelling image. Uh, <laughs> and, and of course, you know, I, I do think that this work is incredibly important. I think it often can be a little bit obscure. I admit I didn't come into my work in the free knowledge movement um, from the perspective of um, a copyright activist. Like I actually came into my work really from the open source community. And while there is certainly a common intellectual kinship, they are at times different communities. And so it was a tremendous learning journey for me during my time at Wikimedia to really become far more fluent in, in some of these issues and to even feel comfortable advocating for them. And I think that's often a thing that, that makes it hard for people is that there are legal complexities to this. Sometimes we do talk about these uh, issues in ways that are overly legalistic. And, and mm -hmm. that's reasonable because again we are dealing with legal regimes um, but it can often be can feel a little bit daunting to outsiders to really talk about what does it mean to create free culture and why is it so important and so I just really love to come back at all times to sort of what is the actual value to people and for me the actual value to people is the creation of culture the creation of um, of remixes and sharing and furthering of, of intellectual exploration and of course as I said the ability to share and give credit uh, to those who come before us and for those whose shoulders that we stand on, so. I think that's a, that's a very nice, that's a great uh, empowering closing statement. Mm -hmm.